Welcome to Central Study Hour here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Wherever you may be watching, thank you so much for joining us today and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to those who are right here in the sanctuary live with us. We are going to our special request that came in from Stacy here from Sacramento, and she chose hymn number 606, Once to Every Man and Nation. We'll be singing verses 1 through 3. for singing, sending that in to us. If you have a special song request and you would like to sing it with us, please visit our website at sacscentral.org. Click on the contact us link. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and of course the title of the hymn you've selected. And we'll be so happy to sing it with you on an upcoming Sabbath. We move right along to 629 in our topical index. And it is entitled, Oh Happy Band of Pilgrims. And it's probably a new one to you. It was a new one to me, but it doesn't take long to learn. So let's sing it together, verses 1 through 4.
let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath and for what it means for each one of us, a time to come apart and rest and to allow you to come in deeper and have a more uh, personal relationship with us and to teach us. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to constantly look toward heaven while on this pilgrim journey of earth. Help us to remember that we can be a happy band of pilgrims here as we await your return. We ask that your, the Holy Spirit will come and teach us this morning as we listen to the Sabbath school lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Sabbath school lesson will be brought to us by Pastor Fred Dana, our associate pastor here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Welcome to Central Study Hour. For those who are watching on 3BN Proclaim or on some online connection or live streaming, uh, we're glad you're here. And we look forward to a good lesson study. Uh, the lesson that we're doing today is from the uh, Coralie on, on Peter. It's lesson number two called An Inheritance Incorruptible. And if you're interested in receiving a CD or a DVD of this lesson, call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at sacscentral.org and ask for offer number C21714. And make sure that you specify if you want a CD or a DVD and make sure you leave us an address so we can send it to you. Let's open it up to Sabbath afternoon. And again, the title is An, Inherit An Inheritance Incorruptible. The title comes from 1 Peter 1, 4, which we will come back to on Tuesday's page. So let's go down to the memory verse. This is an interesting memory verse. It says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Now, the memory verse will be dealt with more on Thursday's page, but if you look at this memory verse out of context, it's a troubling verse. Look at it. You have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. Let me ask you a question. Is it possible to purify yourself by obeying the truth? It's not possible. And so this verse only makes sense when you see it in its context, okay? Um, but we'll come to that. It's a very important verse. Um, maybe the, one, the most important one in the lesson, if, if one can be more important than another. But let's go down to the narrative on Sabbath afternoon's page. It says, whenever one studies the Bible, particularly focusing on one book or even a section of a book, a few questions need to be answered if possible. All right, and then they suggest that question should be, who's the intended audience? Uh, another question is, what is the precise reason this was written? Uh, you know, what's the particular issue the author wants to address? Um, now, if you just sit down and start reading the Bible, do you usually ask yourselves those questions? You actually should. Because if you ask yourself who's being written to and what's the issue that the person's addressing, it really helps under you understand it better. Uh, further down in that paragraph, the last uh, part of it says, much of the New Testament was written as epistles or letters, and people usually write letters in order to convey specific messages to the recipients. When you write a letter, you're addressing a particular person, and all these epistles are like that, and they're easier to understand if we figure out why they wrote. Um, the last paragraph starts with this. In other words, as we read Peter, it would be good to know as much as possible the historical context of his letter. You know, and so I said, what was he saying and why? And maybe most important of all is what message can we get, get from it to understand God's you know, words to us? Now, I usually approach it a little bit different, but it's similar. Um, when I read a passage and I have time to do it right, I always ask this question first. And this is going to seem like a no-brainer, like you don't even need to ask it. What does it say? What does it actually say? Now, I know people don't do that. They don't ask that. You know how I know? Because anytime you ask somebody 
uh, a question about a verse, they always start to, by interpreting it instead of what it actually says. Because our natural tendency is to try to figure out what it means before we've actually listened to it. And so this first step is easily overlooked, it's easily skipped, but it really means you need to notice things. You need to observe. You actually need to listen and let the scripture speak to you without throwing your own ideas at it yet. When I uh, taught, um, in a ca taught academy classes, uh, I, I, I must have been quite a bit different than the teacher before me because when I had, like, say, a worksheet or something and I had a question about what was in that verse, I always got, well, to me it means... And I'm saying, that wasn't what I asked you. And they actually got mad at me because they thought I wasn't accepting their personal experience with God in the verse. And so I try to tell them, you got to understand something. The, one of the big problems in reading the Bible today is everybody reads into it what they already think. Yes. And we have to learn not to do that. And I'll tell you this, Seventh-day Adventists do it just as much as any other denomination. We read into the Bible what we already think and believe. And so if we're fortunate enough to know the truth on something, we won't make big mistakes. But when we get to things where we don't know that much about it, we don't even know what's being said. So I, I, well, this is what I did to try to get them to uh, see my point. I said, I asked this question. I said, when was, when was this particular passage of the Bible written? And they, you know, they say, well, it was like 2,000 years ago. And I said, right. Did it mean something before you were born? Did it mean something before you had thoughts to bring to it? Yes, it did. I said, that's what I want you to tell me. And they go, oh, it was like a brand new thought. And so what does it say is way more important than most people think because when you really want to get a lot out of Scripture, sometimes you just have to observe and look and notice for a while before you try to say, it means this. But when we are short of time, we always jump to, what does it mean? So anyway, the, I have three questions that I think are really important when you're reading Scripture and trying to understand it. Always start with, what does it actually say? Then the second question is, what did it mean? All right? In the original context and the original purpose of the writing, what did it mean? You see, we understand and interpret by historical context and I'll call it literary context. By literary context, I mean just seeing it in the, as one idea in a flow of ideas. Because um, another big problem with uh, misinterpreting the Bible is to not see how a passage fits into the flow of thought that's running through the whole chapter, or at least several verses before and after. And so... We first ask, what does it say? Then we ask, what did it mean? And then we come to, how does it apply today? Or what does it mean for us today? In my experience, people always start with question three. What does it mean now, today? And I'm telling you, if you start with that, you miss most of it. And you end up with something that you like, you connect with it, but you're not really understanding the Bible. And God will work with you anyway, because he's loving, you know. He does all the time, whether we understand or not, right? But if you really want to understand the Bible, you've got to start with what does it say, then what did it mean, and then what should it mean to me, or what, how, what does it mean today, how does it apply today? In other words, what we want to do is we want to determine the principles um, <coughs> that are there in the original meaning, and then you take those principles and say, how do those principles fit today in a new culture, in a new time? And you know the best way to find out what it means today or what it means after the original writer? You look and find out what a, a later inspired writer did with it. And this is where Ellen White's a real blessing because we'll see how she makes an application on a passage. Or you look at how the New Testament writers make an application on the Old Testament writers. Unfortunately, after going through all that, when we do the lesson, we usually try to go too fast and we can't systematically show you how that works. And that's sad. Um, but um, let's go to uh, Sunday's lesson.
Sunday's lesson is where I really had a hard time getting into it. And, you know, but let's just, uh, it's called To the Exiles. And it's a really interesting title for that page, but um, hopefully I'll remember to come back to that title because I think we're going to get something out of it different than the author intended. Okay? So let's go to 1 Peter 1. And in 1 Peter 1, uh, we'll just read the first verse. And the question here is, what can we learn from this one verse that helps to give us a bit of context? All right, so 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So what can we learn from this one verse that helps us a bit with the context? First of all, who's the author? Well, Peter. Peter is the author. And he says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, apostle means one sent. So what he's saying is, I have been sent by Jesus Christ. Now, is apostleship one of the gifts of the Spirit? Yeah, apostleship is one of the gifts of the Spirit. If apostleship is one of the gifts of the Spirit, he's also sent by the Holy Spirit, right? And that makes sense, because Jesus and the Holy Spirit always work together. All right, so he's an apostle of Jesus, meaning one sent by Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. And then it says he's writing to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. In other words, he's writing to believers um, throughout Asia Minor. Uh, if you had a map of the ancient world, you would see that uh, Pontus, uh, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia are all region, regions in Asia Minor, roughly the equivalent to the part of modern-day Turkey, east of the Bosporus Strait. All right, if you know maps, you know you pictured it, right? How many of you pictured what I said, or some of you said, well, whatever. <laughs> See, I'm just different than most people because I always, there's like a photograph of a map in my mind when I say that. And when my wife and I are trying to figure out how to navigate Sacramento, I have a map of Sacramento in my mind. And so I know where I'm going, even if I would never been on that road before. Because I just know the direction and I know what I'll come to. And she says, I, my, I don't have a map in my mind. And I'm thinking, how can you live without a map in your mind? <laughs> But anyway, um, uh, I have this map of uh, Asia Minor in my mind, and I know where Asia is. That's, by the way, that's where the seven churches of Revelation are. And we've seen that map uh, quite a few times up on PowerPoint. So, and so the other ones are all just moving to the right of where the seven churches are. Now, uh, here, here's an interesting thing about, because uh, you're saying, well, who is he writing to? Who are these strangers from Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia? Let me ask you this. Out of those five places mentioned, two of them are where all these missionary stories of Paul happen, or most of them from Acts 13 to 20. Do you know which two? Galatia in Asia. Now what's not here is Greece or Macedonia, and Paul was there too, but so this is interesting because two of these areas are areas where we actually know a lot of stories. We know what happened when Paul went there. Uh, in Asia you have Antioch, I mean um, Galatia, you have Antioch of Pisidia, you have Lystra, Iconium, all right, and then in Asia he spent a lot of time at Ephesus. Ephesus is, is um, the main story of his experiences in Asia. And so what we do know from Paul's experiences in those two areas is that most of the converts were Gentiles and a few Jews because he always went to a synagogue first and then when they got upset and kicked him out, the Gentiles would follow him to a new location and then he would raise up a church. But he always tried in the synagogue first, and sometimes he was, he was run out in one week, and sometimes he managed to be there for several weeks. All depends on how they responded. So that means in Galatia and Asia, the majority of Christians were Gentiles, some Jews. All right, now that's important because right in the lower part of the page, um, not too far from the middle, there's a paragraph that starts that says, debate exists about whether Peter is writing mostly to Jewish believers 
or to Gentile believers. I just gave you the historical context. It's not a debate for me because I know most of the believers were Gentiles. And so to me, the rest of this page was a fruitless exercise in the original Greek. But let's look at it because I want you to understand um, I respect people who know the Greek, but I'm going to give you an example here why it's overrated, okay? And I really want you to get this because there are people who use the Greek like because they know the Greek, they are right. I've seen two Greek scholars totally disagreeing what the Greek means and how to do it. All right? Now, the Greek is very helpful, but it doesn't solve things as well as context itself does. Context itself is always better. Okay? In this case, historical context. So, all right, let's, let's take a look at this. Um, the word strangers in the first verse, it says strangers gathered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. The word strangers, according to the SDA Bible commentary and according to the author of the quarterly, strangers means sojourners or exiles. And when I went to the concordance, the Greek meaning means resident foreigner. That means Paul is saying, I'm writing to people who are living in these lands, but they're resident foreigners in the diaspora. The immediate impression of the Greek means he's writing to Jews. But yet we already learned the majority of the people that are Christians in the area are Gentiles. So how do we deal with that? Uh, well, let's, let's look at some context of the book itself. Let's go to um, chapter 2. In chapter 2, he says some things that reveal who he's writing to. Look at verse 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. The people he's writing to of Pontus, Galatia, Asia, Cappadocia, and Bithynia, he says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Would he say that to Jews? No, because the Jews were the people of God. And if they accepted Christ, they continued to be. But he's, he's calling these people a royal priesthood, and he says, who were once not the people of God, but now are. Now that's clear enough for me. But there's other verses in here that show he's writing to people who once lived in pagan, you know, he heathenism. All right? But the Greek did show that he was writing to Jews. But the context of the book, the historical context, would favor writing to Gentiles who would become Christians. And our, the author of our quarterly left it that some people think he's writing to Jews and some people think he's writing to Gentiles. And the fact that he entitled the lesson The Exiles shows you which side he's on. He favors he's writing to Jews. Now, I got to share with you because this is where I found out something I didn't know before that I thought was pretty interesting. So, you know, I'm, I'm going into the um, uh, SDA Bible commentary looking for help on this because I didn't like that the author of the quarterly just left it like, well, you know, you can decide, you can see who has the best arguments or whatever. Well, let me ask you this. Were there arguments for both? Yeah. And this is interesting. He probably meant both. <laughs> All right, so here in the um, Bible commentary in the introduction, uh, it says the, the apostle, who was the first to baptize Gentiles and to assert their equal status in the church, would no doubt regard all Christians of both Jewish and Gentile origin as one in Christ Jesus without distinction in addressing them. So they're saying here, he wasn't trying to make a distinction, so why are we? Good question, right? So here, here's an interesting thought. When I went to the exact verses in the SDA Bible commentary, they brought out that the Greek language supports writing to Jews who are in exile in a foreign land. And then they said, but no doubt 
Peter was using that metaphorically, symbolically, because what he was really saying is that all believers, Jews and Gentiles, are strangers in this world because our real home is in heaven. Now, isn't that interesting? And so I'm wondering, well, why did the author of the quarterly stop before he got to that? Because, well, let's look at, um, let's go to Hebrews 11, 13. I just want you to see that there's some context with other scriptures that fit this. Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 is going to use the word strangers, the exact same Greek word that Peter used in the beginning of his epistle. Look at Hebrews eleven thirteen. It says, these all died in, the, in faith, not having received the promises. All right, he's talking about all the faithful people in past history. They died in the faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So the usage of that word stranger, the, the Greek word, is a stranger on planet earth. You know, because you're a citizen preparing for heaven and you're in this sinful world. And so could Peter have meant it that way? Sure he could have. And now let's go back to um, 1 Peter 2. Uh, and we're going to see Peter use the word, the same word for stranger in, in, in a way that agrees with the way it is in Hebrews. Uh, 1 Peter 2, we read 9 to 10, let's read 11. It says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So, he's using the exact same Greek word there, and he means it in the sense that we are exiles in a sinful world awaiting our restoration to the promised land. And so I had never seen it that way before. And I was kind of excited about that. But it took me a long time to get there. So I, I, I had a hard time getting into this lesson. So it, anyway, it, it got easier. But, you know, sometimes when you have to work hard, you learn something that makes it all worthwhile. All right, let's go to Monday's lesson. Uh, and we're going to read 1 Peter 1, 2. So we're going to the second verse. So first verse, we see it's Peter writing to the believers uh, scattered in this area of Asia Minor. And in verse 2, uh, the question that we're going to try to answer is, what else does this tell us about those to whom Peter has been writing? What does he call them? All right, so these strangers, he, he says in verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So what does he call those strangers? He calls them the elect, right? The elect according to the foreknowledge of God. All right? Now, I'm going to have someone read 1 Timothy 2, 4 in just a minute, but I don't know who has that. All right, Karen has it. We'll get to you in just a minute, Karen. Um, the author of the quarterly brings up a concern here because whenever you see something like they're elect according to the foreknowledge of God, sometimes people get the idea that means God has, in his foreknowledge, predestined some people to be saved and some people to be lost. And these people and these strangers in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Asia and Bithynia, well, they're the lucky ones because they're predestined to be saved. But some other people that aren't getting this letter aren't so lucky. You know, at least that's the way some people might read it. All right? But they, they make the point here, that's not what the Bible teaches. Let's just think about what John 3.16 says. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth can have eternal life, right? Will not perish, but have eternal life. And so John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, totally blows up this whole idea of predestination because it's whoever will believe. All right, so Karen, are you ready to read 1 Timothy 2.4? Yes. All right, we're ready to go. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. All right, is that pretty clear? Who will have all men to be saved? So does God want anyone to be lost? No, he wants everyone to be saved. Now, since we're in Peter, let's go to 2 Peter 3.9. This is a, a verse, I bet some of you memorized it. 
some point in your life. Um, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible because it fits so many situations. But for, uh, 2 Peter 3 9 <clears throat> says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All right, so the verse Karen read says he wants us all to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says whoever will believe will not perish but have eternal life. And this verse says that God's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. So just in those three verses, is it clear that God doesn't predestine anybody to be lost? Okay. Uh, let's, uh, oh, the, the narrative on the second um, the bottom part of the page is really good. It says, Scripture makes it clear that it was God's plan for everyone to be saved, a plan instituted in their behalf even before the creation of the earth, just as he chose us and him before the foundation of the world. So all are elect. Every one of us is elect in the sense that God's original purpose was for everyone to be saved and no one to be lost. He predestined all humanity for eternal life. This means that the plan of salvation was adequate for everyone to be included in the atonement. Even if not everyone would accept what that atonement offered him or her. So is that pretty clear? But how do you understand this foreknowledge thing? You know, because, you know, if God's foreknowledge and seems like he, you know, he must be doing something. Well, I love the illustration here in the quarterly. It's so simple. It says, God's foreknowledge of the elect is simply his knowing beforehand what their free choice would be in regard to salvation. He knows everything. He can't help but know what we're going to do. All right? That doesn't mean he makes a decision for us. As it goes on, it says, this foreknowledge in no way forced their choice any more than a mother knowing beforehand that her child will choose chocolate cake instead of green beans meant that, that her knowledge of the choice forced the child to make it. Pretty good illustration, right? As, if God has predestined us to be saved and still respects our choice if we don't cooperate, does that mean something to you? It means he really wants us, right? And he, he's there for us. And so what I wrote here is that if God wants me to be saved, surely he gives me every opportunity and assistance so that I will follow him. He does everything he can to make it all work out. Going to Tuesday's lesson, we saw in 1 Peter 1, verse 2, um, a mention of the Godhead and the role of the Holy Spirit in Jesus in saving the elect. The next 10 verses seem to be like a long praise for the gift of salvation. So we're going to start with, Christine's going to read verses 3 to 5, and let's just start getting into this praise, Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's look at verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. All right, what does he say there? By his mercy, he's begotten us again. What does begotten us again mean? Or what's another way of saying it? If, if you were begotten again, what does that mean? Born yeah, you're born again, made into a new person. So he says the mercy of God has caused us to be born anew. And then it says it gives us a living hope or a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How does Jesus' resurrection give us hope? Would we have hope in the return of our loved ones at the resurrection of the end if there hadn't been a resurrection of Jesus? No, we wouldn't even talk that way. We wouldn't have that hope. So the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is pretty, pretty critical to our hope. And then um, verse 4 says, to an inheritance incorruptible, an inheritance incorruptible. What's he saying? What's that mean? 
it says it's reserved in heaven for you. Wow. And then in verse 5, when it says, well, when it says it's reserved in heaven for you, it says who are kept. That's if we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Well, do we need to be kept by the power of God? Yes. What happens if you're not kept by the power of God? It means you end up doing whatever the devil wants you to, That's right? Because right? he's, he's the prince of this world uh, who tries to destroy us. Well, he was cast out, but he's still there, you know, uh, roaring as a roaring lion. And so we have to be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And it says, ready to be revealed in the last time. When's, when's, what's the last time? The last days, Jesus' second coming. So the people who are kept by the power of God through faith and salvation will be revealed in the last time. That sounds like 144 in Revelation, doesn't it? Hmm. All right, let's look at verse 7. Uh, it says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Wow, what's Peter talking about there? All of a sudden, he's talking about this praise stuff, and then he brings in, he's praising God that the, the trial of fire uh, tries your faith so that you, it, your faith becomes more precious than gold. Isn't that what he's saying? So why is he talking about trials of fire? Well, I want you to hold your place there and go to chapter 5. And look at verse 13. This tells us where Peter's writing from. He says, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you. And so doth Marcus, my son. So the people he's writing to in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, he says, I'm sending you greetings from the church that is in Babylon and also from Marcus, my son. What, what did he say? Where did he say he was? Babylon. Do you think he's talking about being the literal city of Babylon? What do you think he's talking about? Yeah, he's, he's talking about being in Rome. Okay? And the only time we know Peter was in Rome was at the end of his life. And that means he's been brought to Rome by the persecutions of Nero. And that means when he's writing to the people about their, tri their trial in the fire and their trial of faith, making them come out as, as more precious than gold, he's talking about the persecution that they're facing. little historical context gives a lot of meaning so you know he's not talking about uh, someone called me a bad name and you know I, I'm just being harassed and persecuted he's talking about the real stuff you know so anyway um, Friday's lesson page four has a question how can our faith grow amid trials <clears throat> That is, what choices can we make to help us learn from the things we suffer? You know, you can learn if you make bad choices. But the question is, how can our faith grow amid the trials? Don't we have to make choices to trust God? And then when he comes through, we say, I can trust him. He comes through. Well, uh, let's continue in the passage. So let's go to verse um, 8. Because, well, verse 7 ended um, about the, with the appearing of Jesus Christ. And verse 8 says, Whom having not seen, ye love. Can you love someone you don't see? If you never saw your spouse, would you still love them after a while? It'd be challenging, right? But Peter's saying, look, Jesus, we haven't seen him, but we love him. Because you know, if, you, if another human being, if you never see him, you would conclude there's no relationship. But it's not like that with Jesus because the Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts by faith. We can have a relationship with Jesus and we can experience him every day even though we don't see him with our eyes. 
That's how we can love them, right? Uh, in verse 9, it talks about the salvation of your souls. Verse 10 says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. This is an interesting verse, verse 10. Um, it teaches us something about the gift of prophecy. Because it's talking about the prophets of old. It says, They inquired and searched diligently. And, and they also prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. In other words, the prophets in the Old Testament prophesied the Jesus event and the gospel, but it says that they inquired and searched diligently. Why did they have to inquire and search diligently if they were prophets? Because prophets only know what God tells them. And when Jeremiah came along, and God gave him a message, he would go look and see what Isaiah said so he could understand it better. And Daniel looked at what Jeremiah wrote, trying to understand God's purposes. God never has given one prophet all the knowledge there is. And so when prophets get messages from God, they still search the right, inspired writings before them to try to get a better understanding. So, it, you know, here's the, the key thing is, while prophets are revealed very important things, they don't know everything. And we shouldn't treat them like they do. <laughs> okay? But, uh, well, verse 11 talks about Christ's uh, sufferings and the glory that should follow. You know, the sufferings of Christ we get because that makes us think of the cross. But what's the glory to follow? What glory followed the cross? Wouldn't it be the resurrected Christ? And then the ascended Christ. Yeah. All right. And then the last part of verse 12 talks about the gospel being preached unto you with the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Now, that's an interesting expression. The angels desire to look into it. Whoa. Why? Don't they already understand everything? No, they don't. Angels are created beings who have to learn. Similar way we learn. They don't have all the obstructions to learning. We do. So they can learn easier. But can you imagine angels, while they're watching the development of the great controversy, and as they see the revelations of God, and as they go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and they see the Son of God come down and live the life he lived and go to the cross, don't you think they were learning a lot? Angels were thrilled as they learned more and more about these revelations of the character of God. And Peter here is acknowledging that the gospel that we get to experience fascinates the angels and they never stop learning more as they try to understand what God's doing down here with us or for us. It's, it would be totally different if you never experienced sin personally and you're trying to grasp what it means to be saved from it. See, they have a different perspective, and I'm sure they can see things we can't and learn things we can't that we'll learn later, but they also realize there's things we can learn that they don't get because some things are only learned by experience. And they're probably thankful they don't have that experience, but they will still want the understanding, you know? Okay, so... Um, let's look at the question down at the bottom. Uh, it says, uh, about the bottom of Tuesday's lesson, 1 Peter 1, 4 says that there is an inheritance reserved in heaven for you. Think about that on a personal level. There is a specific place reserved in heaven just for you personally. Then how should re you respond, personally respond to this wonderful promise? An inheritance incorruptible is reserved in heaven for you and for me. What should that do to us? Does it sink in? Is it real to you? Uh, Friday's lesson number three had a similar question. Um, it says, Peter talked about an inheritance incorruptible. What does that mean? Think about all the things in this world, in this life, that fade away or that can be destroyed instantly. What should this tell you about the, how wonderful our promised inheritance really is? You know, don't you just wish you could buy a brand new house and 30 years later without having to do any maintenance it was still just as good? It doesn't work that way, does it? 
but the inheritance in heaven is incorruptible. Maintenance would be a whole lot easier if you even have to do it. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll wait to get there and figure that one out. But uh, I'm sure, sure it's going to be a whole lot better. Um, all right, so let's see. Where are we? I think we're ready to go to Wednesday. Okay. Um, this is called Living the Life of Salvation. And I want to start down with uh, where it says, read 1 Peter 1.13. Um, so let's look at verse 13, because this is the next one as we've been working through this passage. It says, after, after all this wonderful stuff about salvation and uh, the gospel and the prophets, you know, prophets foretold it but didn't fully understand it. We're trying to understand it better. And the things that even angels desire to look into. And then verse 13 draws a conclusion. It says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. What, what does that mean? <laughs> Clean it up? Well, um, to really get this statement, you have to think about the way people dressed in Bible times. Because they had a robe and then they had kind of a belt that went around, around their loins. And if they were to gird up their loins, what that meant is, you're getting ready to have to work hard. You can't have that robe going all the way down to the ground. And so they would take the bottom part of the robe and tuck it into the belt so they could work or they could run. That was literally to gird up your loins. But he's saying gird up the loins of your mind. Now, if girding up your loins, you know, with a robe and everything was so that you could be engaged in activity, girding up the loins of your mind must mean Get ready to think hard. Get ready to actively engage your mind in God's work or something, right? So he says, after all this wonderful stuff about the plan of salvation, the grace of God and the resurrection of Christ and the hope and the power of God to keep you, he says, now, gird up the loins of your mind. Get ready to do something for God. Get ready to let your brain be in his service. Be ready to act, to speak. Now the question here says, what does it mean? Because the last part of verse 13 says about the hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you that is, is at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says, what does it mean to rest your hope fully upon the grace revealed in Jesus? Is there any hope in self? The grace of God revealed in Jesus is where all the answers are, right? In fact, it's where all the power is. And so right in this verse, when he says, gird up the loins of your mind, he says, and always basically keep your hope in the grace that is revealed in Jesus. Be why? Because we're nothing without him. It's all based on Jesus. All right, now let's go up to um, the top of the page. Um, and it says, read 1 Peter 1, 13 to 21. Well, we're going to go 14 to 17 first. And the question here is, in this passage, what do we find or what should motivate Christian behavior? Because if God has done all this wonderful stuff for us and we're to gird up our loins and always remember our, we're anchored in Jesus, why should we try to live a good Christian life? All right, so verse 14 says, As obedient children, not fashion yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as... As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So is there a motivation there for serving God and living a Christian life? Or for, you know, being a good person? Because God's character is holy? We want to be holy. All right? We want to reflect God. That's a, that's a motivation. Um, those who follow Jesus must also be holy. Verse 17 gives another motivator, another motivation for why we should try to live the best Christian life we can. Verse 17 says, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. So what's the motivation there to live a good life? <laughs> There's a judgment day, right? You'll be accountable. 
All right, so I think we're ready. To, uh, Richard's going to read verses 18 to 21, and, and we're going to find another motivator there. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. We have three great motivators in that passage. To live a, a good Christian life, we should be motivated because God is holy, because God is judge. And here in this passage, we got the example and the work of Jesus. I mean, he redeemed us. He intervened and, you know, God has intervened for us. Shouldn't we respond? Shouldn't that motivate us? So the question at the bottom is, what motivates you to be a Christian? If someone asked you, why are you a Christian? What would you say? Would you say, because God is holy? That's a good answer. They might not understand it, but it's a good answer. Uh, because God is judged. There's a day of accountability. Well, they might not be ready for that one. That's a little scary. But go to that third one. Because Jesus gave everything for me. Right? All right, let's go to Thursdays. Um, we're going to pick up on um, verse uh, 22. We're just going to read 1 Peter 1, 22, 22 and 23. And this is 22 is the memory verse. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So what's the crucial point that's being made in those two verses? It's interesting. He says, seeing ye have purified your souls. He's saying, look, you already responded to what Jesus did for you. You've already allowed him to make you a new creature. And so this is why he says, seeing you have purified yourselves. He didn't say because you worked yourself up to it. He says because you responded to everything God has done for you and you've allowed him into your life. And so, and then, and then you obey. So the, the, the narrative says Peter's starting point is that Christians are already purified, seeing you have purified, and are living in obedience to the truth. All right, so... Uh, that change uh, results in another change. Um, you know, if, if you're purified and you're obeying the truth, what's the next change that should come in your life? And that's what's in um, verse 22. It says, well, let's look at 22 carefully. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So if we have allowed Christ to cleanse our souls, to make us new, to be born again, a new creature, and we walk in obedience to the truth, isn't a natural part of that mean that we become a loving person? If you don't become a loving person, what do you think about the previous stuff? Probably really didn't happen. It's a game. It's a joke. If you don't become a loving person, you have no evidence that you've been changed. That's why I say there's no such thing as a grumpy Christian. Because if you're grumpy, the, spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is not there. So, you know, I, I'm not that impressed with people who are real zealous about Sabbath keeping, but they're real grouchy. Somehow that's a contradiction. All right? But it, it says here that um, uh, in the quarterly down near the bottom that the love here is agape. It's a pure love that seeks the good of others and, and it's with a pure heart. And that's why verse 22 says being born again because that kind of love can only come from somebody who has been born again. And I'll tell you this, if, and, and I've dealt with a lot of marriage counseling, not a lot, but plenty. Um, and sometimes you have one and the other and all they want to talk about is what's wrong with the other person. And I'm looking at it saying, these people, how in the world are they going to love each other if the love of God doesn't come in their hearts? Because there's just hate and contempt coming out. And so the greatest marriage um, solution is the love of God. Now, there's other things that can be talked about to help people understand each other better, but the, the bottom line is the love of God will change any, any problem. All right? 
So the question at the bottom is, how can we learn to be more loving? What choices must we make in order to be able to manifest the kind of love that comes from a pure heart? You know, James 1.17 says that every good and every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. That means every good thing, even human love, comes from above. So if every good and perfect thing comes down from above, then we can only love in the fullest sense of a pure heart if we are holy through God dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. No one can love with a, with a pure heart like that without also being holy. Because real love like that is holiness. That's the end of the lesson. Good one to end on, right? So I just thank you for joining us. And um, again, if you would like uh, a CD or a DVD, call 916-457-6511 or email csh at sacscentral.org. The offer number is C21714. And make sure you uh, leave an address and specify if you want CD or DVD. So thanks again for joining us. And may God richly bless all of you, wherever you are.